Alejandro just text me. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're super excited today to have uh, several panelists with us as we continue um, Protect Public Schools Week. So today we're gonna be talking about a, a very important issue, uh, charter school transparency. So my name's Alejandra Lopez. I am the proud president of the San Antonio Alliance um, in SAISD. And tonight we have um, Representative Terry Canales and Representative Vicky Goodwin. Um, Representative Mary Gonzalez will be uh, joining us shortly. So I'm gonna start by giving each of the panelists um, just a minute to introduce themselves. So we'll start with you, um, Representative Goodwin. Hi, I'm Vicki Goodwin and I represent House District 47, which is in Central Texas, Western Travis County and far South Austin. So my kids grew up here in Austin going to AISD schools. And while I don't have a lot of charter schools in my district, they do affect the entire state. And I, I do have several that have uh, just been built within the last few years. So this is an issue that I've been researching recently and, and have filed a bill to help with. Thank you. And we'll uh, pass okay. it over to... Oh, Nope, just passing it over to you, Representative. <laughs> uh, my name is Terry Canales. I represent House District 40, which is in the heart of the Rio Grande Valley. Um, I'm the product of public schools. I graduated from a public school that had 85 people, uh, and I attribute uh, everything that I am today to my teachers. Uh, my mother was a school teacher, a retired school teacher. She was a special education um, teacher for many years. She went and got her, made her master's while she was actually a special education teacher and up being an administrator and later principal. Um, so the inner workings of the school, uh, I lived it uh, in my, my living room and my, <laughs> on my breakfast table every day. Uh, and I can tell you that I do have quite a few charter schools in my district. Um, and there's huge concerns um, that have been, you know, reported on widespread in the media about some of the activities and things that are going on. And um, I've been a big advocate since I took office for transparency. And I believe that's what the biggest problem that we've got with charter schools is transparency. And I've filed several bills and, and more to come um, that, you know, shine light on, uh, hopefully we'll shine the light on, on what's, what's actually transpiring here in Texas. Thank you, Representative. Um, and thank you both for being such strong public school advocates. Um, as we all know, Texas is, is definitely a, a battleground state when it comes to the encroachment of charter schools um, on our public education system. And I think we have Representative uh, Gonzalez with us just in time. So if you can hear us, Representative Gonzalez, we just uh, took a minute for everyone to introduce themselves. So if you'd like to tell us who you are and where you're from. I'm so excited to be here. Sorry for the technical difficulties as usual. Um, my name is Mary Gonzalez. I represent the eastern part of El Paso County. I have been a state rep for, gosh, Terry, it's been such nearly, you know, we're going into our fifth term. It seems so long. Um, I'm proudly serve on the Public Education Committee. I am also an appropriations Article 3, which funds education, and I am vice chair of the Local and Consent Calendars Committee vice chair of the Mexican-American Legislative Caucus and chair of the newly formed LGBTQ Caucus. In my daytime life, I'm um, associate director at the Partnership for the Future of Learning at the National Public Education Support Fund. So education is literally all I do all day, whether it's at work, whether it's in the legislature, um, and I also have my PhD in education, or whether it's for fun as I read um, all the literature and research I like to read. So I'm honored and excited to be here, and you're right. Um, Texas is really the battleground for this conversation, and I'm glad to have some of my wonderful colleagues, um, Vicki and Terry, are just great, fierce education leaders, and happy to talk with all y'all today. 
Thank you. So um, let's dive right in. So, you know, something that people may be surprised to hear, um, Texas taxpayers pay an estimated $3.6 billion per year to fund charter schools, uh, essentially creating a second school system that is privately administered, right, outside of democratic control, um, but publicly funded. So, you know, when we consider this, what do you feel the impact of our state funding two school systems has been on our traditional public schools and what are your concerns about continuing that investment in charter schools in the future who do you want to start first we can this one is open to any of you so whoever wants to dive in go ahead well i think that we have one pot of money for our schools which we're always fretting about it not being adequate to ensure that our teachers are paid well and feel like they have a really professional, well-respected job, which they do. Their job is so important. Um, so when you talk about adding so many charter schools, in fact, in the last five years, we've added as many charter schools as exist in Austin, Dallas, and Fort Worth put together. So a huge number of new charter schools. And they're taking from the same pot of money that our traditional public schools are taking from. So what that means is as you open that many new charter schools, inevitably you're gonna have to close some of our traditional public schools. And that's what's happened in Austin. And that is so hard on the families whose kids are going to those schools that have to close. So I'll, I'll weigh in uh, and I wanna echo uh, and agree with Representative Goodwin. So the idea behind charter schools could be good, you know, reducing regulations and increasing innovation, but we've done instead is create a giant black hole where we're sending billions of state dollars with little transparency, zero accountability. Uh, they're growing incredibly fast, as, as you heard Representative Goodwin say, uh, and I don't think that we've had time uh, as a state, and as a legislature to fully analyze if they're actually working for our children or not. But what we've seen, regardless of what we don't know, is what we do know is that there's been huge abuses uh, in in the expansion of charter schools and the way that they're run. And so uh, building on what Representative Goodwin says, uh, you know, there's a theory that it could be good, even if applied to public schools, reducing regulations and and, 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 and increasing innovation. But at the end of the day, uh, unchecked and, un, you know, the, the potential for abuse, as we've seen, is, is, is rampant. I, I don't want to repeat what my colleague said. I know I, I'm learning. <laughs> you would think <laughs> you would think I would have gotten it by now. Um, I want to repeat what my colleague said, but I will say um, what I like to look at when I look at public policy is what is the impact 20 years from now. So if we don't change the ways in which we are operating right now with building a two different education systems, right now we have over 90 charter applications in the queue. Right now, we're spending over $3.6 billion of our state funds. So what does this look like if we were to, and we I'd hardly ever get denied. So let's say we accept 80 of the 90. What does that mean for our public education system as a whole? Um, and, and what is the impact over a decade long period? I think there's some really great research and this is where it's really important. This isn't philosophical or ideological, this is research based. When you talk about the difference of funding between a student in a charter school area or a student in my school district like Socorro ISD, it's over a million dollar difference over K through 12. That has a long term impact on my local school district. And so we just have a lot of things to think about. But the biggest thing for me is how unsustainable it is for the next generation. I think that's such a good point, Representative Gonzalez, you know, to think about what the long term impact on funding two different school systems is. Um, and I think, you know, from 20 years from now just to 20 days from now, obviously school finance um, has become a huge topic at the moment. Um, and so I just wanna open it up you know, uh, to really speak about the COVID-19 pandemic and how has that impacted views on how funding is allocated um, throughout our state? I feel like the pandemic has really taken the attention off of funding because the attention is on opening schools. I have three districts in, in my house district that open to in-person classes fairly quickly, uh, whereas AISD um, held back 
started the school year later this year and um, had a very different approach. And the, the problem has been that there have been so many different guidelines from the state. Um, at one moment, they're telling the local districts they have to figure it out on their own. The next, they're saying, but your funding is tied to how you operate and you have to open. So it's, it's been very challenging this year and families have been somewhat supportive, but at the same time demanding because they want their students back in school. They want an excellent education. And this is a really hard time to provide that top-notch education. And uh, I think some parents have been, like I said, uh, a little more flexible and, and others have been more demanding. So it's, it's really been hard on the teachers and our school districts. But I think that's taken the focus off of school funding for the moment. I would go on further to say, you know, in my dis district, many of the schools were already struggling. Uh, but the charter schools, they're often built physically uh, between my regular ISD schools. So suddenly these schools each lose a portion of their students, but many of the same costs uh, still exist to run those schools, even with a decline in enrollment. So this has compounded the issues around the students who are lost from online learning. And there's literally thousands of students in my district who are lost, we can unaccounted for. Uh, there could be quite a financial hit put on our school districts. And these funding issues, while separate, represent somewhat of a double whammy for our ISDs. Uh, so we're almost, um, there's a lot of duplicative spending, uh, and, and it's definitely affecting the funding of, of my, the, the, the way my schools are funded, and, it, and it's a hit. It's just, it's, it's, all, it's devastating, and, and, and COVID-19 has really been showing us the gaps that we have and what we call, uh, you know, statewide, the digital divide, and it's, it is really, um, for lack of a better term, made a greater divide between the haves and the have-nots and the people that don't have uh, are really suffering and the ISDs themselves are suffering. So I think one thing that COVID-19 really has done and when we think about education as a whole is the alternative model for investment. So here's what we did find out is that schools are very important. I'm so sorry. That schools are really important for um, <laughs> as hubs for, for our community um, and that they were really like where you know, people found out about healthcare access, counseling, food, and here's what schools, which schools are best prepared to handle that, our community schools. I think what it really, what, it, what COVID-19 showed us is maybe instead of building two different education systems where there are different regu regulations and different ac accountability rules and all these different types of things, maybe we should really consider further investing in a model that's working and a model that really saved us during COVID-19, which was community schools. Thank you, Representative Gonzalez. I think, you know, that pitch for community schools is definitely heard, um, you know, in our union world, we know that community schools can not only meet the needs of our communities, but are a proven turnaround model for those schools that may have, um, you know, be struggling in terms of the A, and F, a through F rating, for example. Um, so, you know, definitely appreciate that. Um, so I'm gonna go back to Representative Gonzalez. All of you have filed, um, you know, bills in this session that really try to tackle the concerns that we experience within um, charter schools. So, Representative Gonzalez, you actually just filed a bill that calls on, t on the TEA Commissioner, um, Mike Morath, to conduct a study to compare the enrollment of charter schools to that, that of local ISDs and to evaluate the financial impact um, that charters have on these local school, in school districts. So, what do you hope this study um, can really shed light on for our community members? You know, I really want to create more um, transparency and awareness, and I really want all of our decisions when it comes to public policy to be made based on research and information, accurate information, not a philosophy or ideology. So I filed bill, House Bill um, 684, I think, and um, I have to look it up now that I'm thinking about it. Um, yeah, 684, and what it really does is it asks for more information, because this information isn't easily available. and. Um, It'll evaluate the damaging impacts um, with that, have, that are happening with the charter school system against the public school system. For example, charters don't accept all students. We know that they don't accept many um, special education students. I'm so sorry I have these dogs <laughs> living in a virtual world. Um, charters receive more maintenance for uh, more money for maintenance and operations, and we need to understand how much more 
um, charters that can pay their teachers considerably less than public schools, and we need to understand that as well. We've seen how teachers are so important in this moment. And so there's so many things that we need to uncover. And here's what I will say. Um, I care, when I think about what I care about a lot, and really even the most, some of our most vulnerable students, special education. That is one area where we know we need to have more transparency, accountability, and understanding, and that's what I hope my bill will create. Thank you, and, and you actually just touched on something that kind of leads us into our next topic of conversation, um, which is one of the big issues with the state's funding of charter schools, is that charter schools fundamentally seem to get to play by a different set of rules than our public school districts. They're often exempt from the same academic standards, health and safety rules, civil rights requirements, not to mention um, as a union member, right, their lack of um, union representation for the workers on the campuses. Um, they have a record of cherry picking the students they serve. I know, you know, as a proud public school educator, um, you know, it's always uh, interesting to what student to see what students end up back in the public schools after a stint at the charter schools, and then they are kindly asked to leave, um, you know, the, the charter schools. And, and, and they do come back to us because we are going to give them a quality public education. So, you know, my question is, what can or should the legislature do to address accountability within the charter school system? And so we'll go to Representative Goodwin first. Well, we really should have a level playing field. Since they are public schools and they're getting our public taxpayer dollars, they should follow the same exact rules that our public schools do. So when it comes to accountability and, uh, you know, the A through F ratings and just, and like Dr. Gonzalez says, having all that data available so that we can really know what's happening in those schools. You know, I think it's it's crazy that you have some of these charter schools that are getting D's and F's, and yet the same charter company or institution can open more of those schools. We see that happening, and that's wrong. So we definitely need to have a level playing field. Would anyone else like to touch on this question about accountability? Sure. Sure. I mean, I'll, I'll, I, you know, I totally agree with Representative Goodwin. Um, a level playing field is 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 paramount. Um, you can't tell me that one's better than the other without knowing what's going on. And so, uh, my office is actually working on legislation hasn't been filed yet to deal with the financial secrecy and the conflicts of interest at charters. Uh, we've got to shed light on charter schools. Uh, from my position, we need to bring them in line uh, with regular schools. Um, if you're in for a penny, you're in for a pound. Uh, if you take one cent of public dollars, then you need to disclose the manner in which you're spending those funds. We hear a lot from charter schools that, oh, we get a lot of private investments. But the reality is, in order to get those private investments, they have to have a certain amount of public investment. And so how do you uh, divide or, 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 or say what, separate one from the other? You can't. And so... Um, Going back to you're in for a penny, you're in for a pound. If you're taking public money, and we're not talking about small amounts, we're talking billions of dollars. Uh, in my uh, in my district, the the largest uh, charter schools uh, idea of public schools, which if their new schools are approved, they're going to be receiving more funding than the entire UT system. That and with no accountability, um, the reality is. We've got to lift the veil that they operate under so that the public and everybody can see what's going on. And, and it's just uh, it's disheartening to believe that we've let it go this far and we've got to act quickly and swiftly. And so that, um, you know, it, it's 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 imperative that we see that we see and, and understand what they're doing with all our public money. Ditto to both my colleagues. They're they're exactly right. So are there any um, kind of policies that y'all are looking into bringing, um, you know, so that charters are more in alignment with the expectations we have of our traditional public schools? So go ahead, Vicki, I'll, I'll defer to you. <laughs> well, I know uh, actually Representative Hinojosa last time around had some had a bill, which I'm guessing she's going to attempt 
this time as well to make sure that um, the charter schools have to accept the same students that public schools accept and um, that they don't have this ability to kick students out if they're if they don't if they're misbehaving. So um, I know I will support bills like that. The, the bills that I have right now are going to try to curb the, the new charter schools and to make it more transparent when uh, charters are trying to expand. But I think it's also very important to make sure that, um, you know, they, they are following all the same rules as our public schools. So I have a bill in drafting that's going to specifically address charter school ethics and the governance of those charter schools. So there are often conflicts of interest at our charter schools, which would absolutely never be allowed at our regular ISD. Superintendents and board members are self-dealing with the school. Often people are paid by charter schools with a private management company. It becomes unclear whether certain charter employees have more allegiance to the private business interest or the actual charter school and the schools and the teacher and the kids they're supposed to be teaching. Uh, and so I've got a bill that will be filed that will deal with the ethics and governance of charter schools, again, trying to level the playing field uh, and bring to light what we know is, what we know is happening, uh, but we need the, the school themselves to disclose. Yes, Representative, I believe your bill specifically addresses um, severance payment to superintendents or administrators serving as chief executive officers of open enrollment charter schools. Um, anything that specifically prompted you to file a bill that really speaks to the ethics? I know you just talked about some conflicts of interest, but you know anything uh, specific that you've seen that really causes concern? So that's one of them. Uh, that's one of the bills, and you've seen that one. Uh, every session, I've, I've done my best uh, since I was elected to bring government transparency and open government agenda to Austin. Uh, I believe you're referring to Bill 189, which would end the practice of excessive taxpayer-funded severance packages uh, at the state-funded charter schools. Uh, basically, the state law currently gives a commissioner of education the power to reduce a school district's funding by the amount that a superintendent's severance payment exceeds a one-year salary and benefits. But that relevant section of the Texas Education Code does not apply to charter schools, um, unfortunately. Uh, so my bill would bring the charter schools in line with the regular independent school districts, again, leveling the playing field. Uh, no public schools should be using taxpayer dollars to pay exorbitant severance packages to administrators. Uh, this loophole in particular allowed IDEA public schools, the largest charter school operators, to pay their CEO a severance of $900,000, uh, even though his base pay was not even close. And so uh, that's the instance that you're talking about. Uh, that's what drove the, it was the the, the genesis of the, the policy that we've crafted. Uh, but it also, once again, levels the playing field, brings charter schools in line with public schools, uh, which is in this policy in particular that the, the, the public schools are subjected to is great policy. And uh, it was made for a reason and so charter schools should have to play by the same rules. It's, it's, we're the stewards of the tax dollars and we need to make sure uh, that these abuses end once and for all. Yes, I, th I couldn't agree more. I think the key word there is abuse. Uh, you know, here in San Antonio, IDEA charter schools have been allowed to proliferate. Um, they are certainly in our district. And when I just think about you know, the average family income of a family in our district and our working class communities of color, uh, the fraction that that is compared to a $900,000 severance, pa $900, severance package, it is most definitely a, an abuse. And I think just really speaks to the priorities of the charter school um, operators oftentimes, right? It is not about our, our children, about our families. Um, you know, it's about taking public dollars out of public institutions. Um, so we appreciate your work on that. Um, so y'all have mentioned this before, right? Despite strong opposition, Commissioner Marath um, recently approved 12 expansion amendments for idea charter schools um, who we have just you know stated are pretty controversial costing the state an additional 16 million above the cost of what it would take to educate the same students in a traditional public school so just like we've been saying right this money that could be going into um, you know our public 
schools, you know, having been a teacher at a public school, right? I can tell you, we could certainly do a lot with $16 million. Um, you know, the need is there, especially with COVID, um, when we're also dealing with health and safety issues um, that need attention. So the commissioner's power to approve charter applications has been relatively unchecked. So what, in your opinions, can and should be done to rein things in with charter expansions? I'll go ahead and start. Um, I, I appreciate this question. I think that that's an area where we haven't really looked at as charter expansions and the power we give to the TEA commissioner. Look, I, I'm thinking of anybody watching and I'm like, they're just gonna think we hate charter schools. And I'm like, yeah, we, we have concerns about charter schools, but we have concerns for very real policy reasons. Some very real policy reasons that stem from previous bad actions. If there had not been bad actions, if there had not been like um, very negative harms, then we, there wouldn't be this critique or concern, but there has been, whether it's IDEA or other areas of the charter school um, ex movement. And so that's why when we think about expansion, we have to be extremely critical. Right now I'm drafting a bill, it's a charter school expansion omnibus bill that looks at all the details about expansion. Like if, for example, if you, like as Representative Goodwin said, if you have a school that's ranked DRF, then you shouldn't be allowed to even apply for expansion. We wouldn't, I mean, that is a serious concern. They already get more money, less regulation, and they're still getting DNFs. And then they want to have more? Like, it doesn't make any sense. Um, so we want to rein in charter expansions. We want to really um, limit the power the TA commissioner has to approve these charter schools. Um, this, the, the answer to that is increased legislative oversight of TEA. Um, and the S and it, and with the SBOE is in, involved, and we can limit the number of charter schools being opened each, each year. So this, like, so we can have the system be more accountable, um, and it doesn't spiral out of control. Yeah, I think uh, most people don't realize how easy it is for new charters to to uh, be built, new new charter schools to be built. Once you have that initial charter, like idea or KIP or so forth, uh, you know, it's very easy to add new buildings. It, it's just through the approval of the commissioner of TEA as opposed to going before the State Board of Education. Um, it doesn't take into account important issues like student equity, fiscal impact to the state or local school districts. And it doesn't, re it doesn't even require the charter school to say where it's gonna be built. So um, what got me really interested in this issue was uh, a group of parents who said there, there's two elementary schools that are fairly close together right now. And now a, a third, a charter school is going to be built right down the street. Why do we need so many elementary schools so close together? And uh, so that's when I started researching how, how easy it is for the charter schools to build new schools without anyone, parents, um, or school districts knowing that that's going to happen. If we can allow the parents and the school districts that, that information ahead of time, they might ask more questions and, and show up before the State Board of Education and express their views, whether or not they think that charter school is even needed in their neighborhood. So I, I just want to add to both of my colleagues' comments. So. You know, it's not, it's not, I guess you could say reining in charter, the, the commissioner's power is one thing, but reining in the ability once that, that uh, school or has been granted permission, that in and of itself has to be reined in. So there's two real aspects of reining it in. Uh, but I have not drafted a bill, but I look forward to working with Representative Gonzalez uh, and contributing to her omnibus bill. One of the ideas that I think we need to be talking about is that charter school applications are submitted yearly. Uh, and so I believe that um, we should push this at the very minimum to every two years. That would more closely align it with our legislative sessions, giving us a stronger oversight uh, over the, this continual expansion nonstop. Uh, and from my understanding, TEA, and TEA staff are overwhelmed with charter school applications. So by moving it to every two years, we'll say TEA staff and time money, and it would give the legislature uh, some breathing room to actually evaluate and see exactly you know, some of the ideas that Representative Goodwin has, the the placement of these schools, uh, or, or may, you know, there's so many things. It's just unfettered access and unfettered building. Um, it's rampant. And so 
we've got to do something to rein them in because that's uh, unchecked. This is, it's 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 a disaster. Thank you, everyone. Oh, I'm sorry. Someone was going to jump in. Yeah, it was ahead. something that uh, Representative Canella said made me think about. Two of the charter schools in my district are both situated in places that traditional public schools just wouldn't uh, do that. They, they have no space for parents to drop off and pick up the students. And they just didn't take into consideration the, the layout of the school on the piece of property. And so uh, what neighbors in the neighboring residential areas have complained to me about the fact that the cars stack up and they block traffic. Um, so I know that's, that's a minor consideration, but it's something that I've never seen with our traditional public schools. They tend to have the space needed for parents to safely drop off and pick up their students. And at the One Idea School that's located on Slaughter Lane, there have been two deaths as parents have been crossing the street to get back to their neighborhood because the the, the way it's situated is just not safe. That's terrible um, to know that, you know, something that could have been prevented through careful planning um, was not. Um, so I know Representative Goodwin, can you share with us um, some of the changes that were proposed in your bill that add additional requirements for charter schools seeking permission mm -hmm. to expand? Um, what kind of problems are you hoping that this will address? Sure, it would require the State Board of Education review of a new charter um, to look at any previous non-compliance of the charter school with relevant financial governing educational and operational standards. It would um, include student equity issues such as the level of special education students relative to the nearby district campuses and fiscal issues including the cost to the state and to the local school districts. So that information would be provided so again, so that parents and the school district can, can know what's going to happen. Um, it would in, require the expansion request to include the, the cost to the foundation school program. So they would actually have to figure out what this is going to cost the state and provide that information. That's so important. It just seems, it seems amazing that that's not required right now. Yeah, absolutely. It's just, you know, um, a lot of decisions being made without a lot of transparency, as I believe Representative Canales uh, mentioned earlier. Um, so, you know, in thinking about uh, transparency, about accountability, um, there seems to be somewhat of an underlying problem, which is that HB3 specifically gave the Commissioner of Education a great deal of authority. Um, and as we know, this, that is, you know, um, a political position, right? Um, so how do you see the legislature combating the overreach of the TEA on educational issues that significantly impact the state budget and future legislatures. Mary, do you want to jump in on that one? <laughs> <laughs> sure. I, um, so, so first of all, I I think um, you know, bless his heart, Mike Morath has had a really rough year, like all of us have had. The teachers counselors, principals, superintendents, everybody's had a, parents, everyone's had a really rough year. So I, I bless his heart. But, but what I do think this year has, well, I think it's important because I feel like, you know, I, I, I can't imagine being put in that position. I mean, maybe one day I think, okay, I could be TEA commissioner, but being TEA commissioner during a global pandemic, that's maybe that's something else, right? But the point of the matter is, is, um, I do think that with this moment in time or over the last couple of years has really shown us as legislators is that we have a really big responsibility to be more engaged and involved at watching our agency heads and what they do, not only in TEA, but a lot of different agencies, because if we're not monitoring, unfortunately, I'm not sure the governor is monitoring. So that leaves a big gap of accountability um, and, and transparency to our agency heads. And so I think now more than ever, we need to make sure that we only 
that we don't only understand our personal responsibility as legislators, but we institutionalize that responsibility in a different way. So he is in, he and or she in the future is required to communicate with the people who are ultimately ultimately held accountable, and that's the elected officials. So I'll, I'll weigh in. Um, you know, I, I, I really appreciate uh, Representative Goodall's sympathy for Mr. Morass. Uh, I unfortunately don't share that sympathy. Uh, in fact, I share a great deal of frustration as a parent of five children uh, who TEA was deciding to work remotely while they wanted to send my children back to school in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, and he was at the helm of that. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, as difficult as it is, common sense isn't really hard. Uh, and so uh, I don't have any tears for the commissioner, uh, but the reality is education is the most important issue uh, that the legislature deals with. We have to ensure that the legislature has a voice in TEA action. The governor and TEA commissioner should not be making all the decisions without our input, especially the Texas House and the members who are closer to the people than any of these high executives. Uh, we're a more diverse body and we bring a bigger, a be bigger and better perspective and that's important for public education. Uh, the legislature's voice when it comes to public education is paramount. Uh, and so uh, not only do we need to rein in uh, the expansion of charter schools, we need to rein in TEA. Uh, and so um, it's, it's, it's important going forward uh, that we realize uh, what the, the pandemic has actually uh, uncovered um, is that when the, you know, when the rubber meets the road, um, TEA has a little too much discretion uh, when it comes to major decisions. Uh, and I think that the, the legislature needs to make some decisive actions this session um, that um, have some teeth in it when it comes to uh, our children, our teachers, and especially the expansion of charter schools. And I'll just say that uh, I, I think that the head of TEA, the commissioner, should be in a position where he is supporting public schools. That's that's his role is to support them. And we've had all of our superintendents, all teachers, legislators saying we need to waive star test this year. That's too much pressure, too much anxiety on all, everybody involved. And yet he still hasn't made that decision. And he with the governor. Um, that and and making strings attached to finance you know you get your money schools if you do what we tell you to do and i think that's the wrong approach he needs to be there to say we support you this is going to be a really tough school year and let me know what i can do to help you but that's that's not the way it's been and uh we we need to ensure that uh going forward we have a mechanism to make sure he doesn't have so much power over our schools, he or she. I, I just want to add, he or she. Uh, I just want to add real quickly. You know, we, in, in adding on what uh, Representative Goodwin says, we just delivered a, a petition with over five thousand names, and it's still growing to the governor to cancel the star test. Um, it's it's as like I said, a father of five children. It's devastating uh, to know that my children have not, and I live it personally, have not had the the, the same access, have not had the same normal education and to subject them to a test that's also going to be determinative of funding is catastrophic. Um, and, and there's no other excuse for them to proceed with this other than somebody's got a fat pocket full of money at the end of the day. The testing companies are just making money hand over fist. There's just really no realistic way and no other way for us to, for them to explain it to us. Why would you do this to the children? Why would you do this to our teachers? Why would you do this to our schools? It's just not, there's again, and I'll go back, common sense isn't hard. Um, and so we've got we've got to check, we've got to put these people in check and, and, and the legislature's the body to do it. Thank you, Representative. And I, I do wanna say on behalf of, uh, you know, Texas AFT members throughout the state, y'all's advocacy around STAR is, is appreciated and noticed. Um, you know, at the moment, STAR has become such, uh, you know, an issue for our educators, our families, our students. Again, like you said, why are we worrying about this right now, right? We have teachers in the classroom who are doing everything they can to keep themselves and their students and families safe from this virus. Um, 
um, to have the additional pressure of, of something like standardized testing on top of that uh, is just really unwarranted at the moment. Um, and I guess that kind of leads me into, you know, another question about how we do get people um, informed and invested in, in these issues, right? I know as a public school educator, as a proud union member, uh, I, you know, anyone that will listen to me uh, can hear me, you know, kind of explain charter schools and, and you know, kind of the, the funding of two systems. Um, you know, what do y'all do to kind of really engage folks in this conversation in your own districts? I'm really fortunate that I think my the number one issue my district cares about is education. So people come to me to want to have this conversation. And I think this is really critical because I think one thing we've learned is elections matter, right? And so in my district specifically, this conversation is a giant conversation about where do I stand on supporting public schools? And that really gives me the energy to be really fierce about supporting public schools and understanding that creating two public school systems, a charter school system and a public school system ultimately hurts the most vulnerable students. It allows for there to be um, two separate and unequal systems and the most vulnerable fall through those cracks. And so my district understands that. And so they, I'm so grateful to represent House District 75 because they allow me and encourage me to come into the Capitol kind of like a little Texas tornado with a fierceness on this issue. Um, but that means that can be done in any district. So um, for those of you who aren't in my district and watching, although I see my district people, I love you. Um, please, please be, continue to hold legislators accountable. A lot of a, legislators will say, I care about public education and then go support ch ch um, the expansion of charter schools. You can't care for both. And especially if you are not holding them accountable, if you're not asking the right questions and you really need to ask if your legislator really cares about public schools. So I just want to say I've seen Mary personally and she's an F5 tornado. Um, and so <laughs> I, I think it's a, pleasure, it's, a pleasure, it's a pleasure to serve alongside of people who care so much. Um, it really puts things into perspective and, and, and education is the greatest equalizer. It turns a mirror into a window, allows people to see the world for what it is. And it's, it's really like not hard. Like Mary said, most people understand what's going on. Most people see it. Uh, and, and almost everybody that I know has somebody that's teaching in their family. Uh, and there's, uh, they're they're not only educating at school; they're educating at home on the policies that are that are helping and hurting Texans. And so, um, my office, by and large, through this pandemic, is try to use social media. Information's power, and when I've got information, we disseminate it as quickly as possible. You know, having I say our greatest our greatest challenge is uh, this day and age is, is sorting out truth from fact, and then publishing it and getting people to listen and, and see it. Uh, and so, um, but I will tell you, social media has been a great um, help to advancing this cause because it's our way of communicating. We're doing it right now. And so I would tell anybody and everybody that says, you know, how do, how do I get involved? Well, one, uh, find the facts, make sure that the facts and then post them. You know, we, we, we're fond of posting what we cooked on Friday night. What we need to talk about is what our, what's going on with our teachers and our kids. And, you know, it's, it's, it's great to say, tell everybody it's your birthday. Uh, but you know, there's a child that's having a birthday every single day, uh, and that kid deserves a real education, and that's what we should be posting about. That's that's what I think the tool that we try our best to use, and I think other people should be doing the same thing. Yeah, I will say it's hard getting people's attentions these days. There's everybody's going through a really rough time, um, and so I think definitely we I've used social media as much as I possibly can. Pre-pandemic, obviously, was out and. I would talk about education all the time because like everyone here has said, education's always important to everybody. Even if you don't have kids in schools now, you know that it's important for them to have the jobs that will sustain our, our state going forward. So education is foundational. It's easy to talk about, people like to hear about it, um, but it's, it's a little bit more challenging reaching people these days. So. I think repetition is important and I've really worked hard personally to, to be more active on my social media on both Twitter and Facebook um, to, to try to do little sound bites, little bits at a time 
So maybe taking a story about a charter school and reposting it. Um, you know, I had a lot of people that paid attention when the charter schools were doing the crazy things like buying the private jet, um, paying, paying the huge severance package, things like that, that really get people's attention. Um, unfortunately, it takes those sensational stories sometimes to get their attention. Um, but then we can follow up with, with more information about how it's affecting your neighbors how it's affecting the, the schools, how it's affecting our public teachers, our public school teachers. You know, If we're having to split that pot of money, how are we gonna sustain the promise that we made with House Bill 3 in uh, providing adequate funding for our schools and paying our teachers well? Thank you. Um, so, you know, we're closing out our hour here soon. Um, uh, you know, I think at this point, right after the 2020 election that we just had, I feel like uh, engagement in, you know, the political conversations that are happening is at an all time high. I think people are engaged, they're paying attention, um, whether it's because they're being hard hit by this economic crisis or by the, you know, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, people are really paying attention to what our legislators are, are doing. And I'm sure, you know, we're all looking forward to, um, for better or worse, the session that y'all are about to enter into. So I just want to give each of you an opportunity to kind of close out with some remarks um, what should people be paying attention to this upcoming session? What are you looking forward to? Um, you know, what are you going to be really out there um, pushing on? Well, I'll go first. <laughs> Obviously, the budget's going to be the, the tough thing and uh, making sure that we do keep the promise of House Bill 3 making sure that even if it requires dipping into the rainy day fund, that we send that message out there, that um, there's several things that we can do to make sure that we do continue funding our public schools. It's That's really foundational. Um, there are some environmental issues that I think sometimes get forgotten about, but you know, we have climate change to deal with. And that's part of education is, you know, teaching our kids the science and teaching them how to take care of the earth. But we've also, we've got to work on it now. And we can't say, oh, the budget and redistricting are going to take all the air in the room. I hear that so often from other legislators and, and uh, lobbyists and advocates and so forth that um, redistricting and our state budget will take all the air in the room, but there's so many important issues. So hopefully we can, you know, put our noses to the grindstone and, and get some important things past this session, despite the challenges that we have with the budget. So I guess I'll, I'll weigh in and, and tell you that, you know, um, uh, we, live, we live in a state that considers itself a red state. I say it's a non-voting state, but um, nevertheless, the legislature is quote unquote conservative. You can't tell me one conservative thing about a charter school buying jets putting commercials on super bowl sunday uh there's nothing conservative about lack of transparency um the commingling of, of businesses uh with education uh using money for personal funds or per personal expenses none of that's conservative so you can't tell me that so i think that i like i'm going to spend uh much of the session calling out the hypocrisy. Uh, I, I would love it if if the conservatives actually acted conservative. If they did what they preach, if they practice what they preach, charter schools would not be doing what they're doing today. Um, you you can't you can't, you can't mix them both. Uh, I believe that the, the Texas probably does have a lot of conservative values, uh, but the reality is having conservative values and practicing what you preach are two different things. And so when it comes to charter schools, if the legislature is truly conservative, they need to put their money where their mouth is uh, and they need to practice those policies uh, that they're preaching and show us uh, because there's nothing conservative about what's going on in Texas. And I think that uh, whatever legislative agenda uh, we push, transparency, um, reining in charter schools, uh, it's, they're, they're to some degree calling out the hypocrisy of the leadership that exists today. Um, so I think that next legislative session is going to be really hard. I, I think that we have a global pandemic and economic recession, political transition. We have a middle, million, a million things going on, and it's going to be a hard session. 
Um, here's what I do feel strength about. Um, I do feel that the house stands committed to supporting education. I think we showed that in HB3, where we came together to overcome um, a lot to really pass historic legislation. Um, but I think it also happened because the voters held us held us accountable and said, said this is what they wanted. So um, I will say that to start on a positive. Um, I, you asked us what we're going to focus on, and I would be um, not a I would be remiss to say that my biggest piece of legislation has to deal with the El Paso shooting. Um, a year ago, we had the most traumatic event happen in my community. Um, and the whole delegation has legislation to deal with the shooting. For me, it's a bill that a lot of educators have asked for, a digital citizenship curriculum bill. We know that the shooter who came from 500 miles away really learned what he learned on the internet because he wasn't given the tools to navigate hate speech and the dark web and all these other awful things that can happen on the internet. We live in a globalized um, internet society and if we don't give children, young people, the right tools, that's when bad and dangerous things can happen. And so that's what my bill is working to address. And I'm looking forward to talking to all these educators um, about the digital citizenship and what we can do to support our young people in this changing world. Um, but I will say my second priority after the budget is really thinking about, because these are intertwined, is with the long-term effects of having two education systems in the state of Texas. So thank you for hosting this really powerful night. And thank you to my uh, colleagues, uh, Representative Goodwin and Representative Canales. Uh, I just really enjoy working with them. And so and at AFT, we really love you, especially my ones back home. So. <laughs> Mary loves working with me until she doesn't. Oh yeah, that is so true. One day, y'all, I, I mean, it's not a secret. I will tell him sometimes, but you know, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, we, we 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 all agree sometimes, and we all disagree sometimes. That's the legislature. Although I, I usually always agree with Vicky Goodwin. I just want to put that out. <laughs> and likewise. <laughs> I see what you did there, Vicky. Emotions definitely run high. <laughs> um, well, thank you all so much. I also want to extend, um, you know, on behalf of our members in Texas AFT, our gratitude to each of you, um, again, for being fierce public school, um, public education advocates. Uh, we will definitely be doing everything we can to engage our members around these important issues. We have a lot of um, kind of exciting actions coming up during the session to ensure that legis um, that y'all are all listening from those of us that are on the front line in our communities, um, in our schools. Uh, so we look forward to, to working with you in the spring. Um, so thank you for joining us. I thank you for everyone who tuned in. This was a part of our Protect Public Schools um, week of programming tonight, talking about charter school um, transparency. And so we hope that you will check out the other events that we have going on this week. Um, you can take a look at us on our Facebook at Texas AFT. On, and of course, follow each of y'all on your social media at y'all all sound like y'all are super active. Um, so we'll definitely be keeping up to date on what y'all are doing during this legislative session. Thanks, y'all. Thank you.